please give a big open group warm welcome to Stephen Cole. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. <clears throat> right. Morning, everybody. I, I trust you're all well and not feeling too jaded from a night in Edinburgh last night. I, I, I don't know what was the most exciting bit, whether the prospect of um, tasting some fine distilled whiskey um, or talking about nuclear submarines, um, but we'll, we'll see how far we get with that. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to take you through a few uh, bits and pieces really and then later in the morning you'll be hearing a lot more from some of my business colleagues where we're using some really interesting applications of TOGAF to help us design and develop the way that we try to transform the business. Um, I'll give you a bit of context, uh, strategic overview to the business. That's about submarines but also a little bit about BAE systems. Um, I'll describe to you the architected approach and some of the reasons that we've adopted this method to help us work through a whole range of business challenges. Um, how digital strategy, how we're using information management systems and technologies to help us deliver business performance and the architecture that we're using to do that. Um, and then I'll close with just letting you know exactly where we've got to. <clears throat> so, um, BAE systems, um, I'll just before I get into the submarines piece, um, BAE Systems is a multinational defence contractor. Most of you in the room, I'm sure, have, have heard of us. We operate in three major territories, uh, North America, which is a um, somewhat firewalled off part of our business in order for us to comply with DOD regulations. Um, we operate in Europe quite extensively. We have obviously a very large customer in the Ministry of Defence. Um, but we also have extensive operations in the Middle East, particularly in Saudi Arabia um, and some other territories. About an £18.5 billion pound turnover business employing about 85,000 people. Um, I was with our chief counsel last week and he was reminding us all that BA Systems um, is, is very much in the FTSE regarded as a yield stock. So we're there to deliver long-term sustainable dividend payments to our shareholders. We're not really in the business of taking big risk. As a defence contractor, you could probably imagine that. And the, the profile that we have as a business is to try and be predictable and deliver long-term value. Um, and that sometimes brings into our organisation a culture which is a little bit risk averse. And when we're setting out with transformation projects and trying to generate new business models, those cultures can um, somewhat contradict one another and we have to consider how we get through that and how we manage the business dialogue when we're developing some of the world's most complex um, large platforms for the defence sector. Um, the submarines business um, is obviously at the forefront of some of that risk area. We've, um, we do some unique things. We put um, high explosives right next to nuclear reactors. We put that inside a steel tube with a hundred people and send it to the bottom of the oceans. Um, that's quite an interesting engineering challenge. It's quite a difficult build challenge and how we deliver all of that to quality to make sure that we safeguard the lives of the Royal Navy submariners that, that ride on our submarines. Um, you don't take a huge amount of risk in that type of business profile as you could probably imagine. Um, so we're very cautious with what we do and I think if you just bear that in mind when we go through our case studies this morning, I think you realise how important it is that we have a designed architected approach to our business. The submarine's um, role in the UK submarine capability. Um, so we are the designers, the integrators and test and commissioners of uh, the UK, the Royal Navy's fleet of nuclear submarines. Um, that's obviously commissioned by the Ministry of Defence, but with both the, the Navy and the, and the Ministry, we do have a complex customer landscape there that we have to be on top of. We have two major products. Both of those are run as major programs. Um, we are currently building the Astute class of submarines. That's the Navy's um, Hunter Killer Submarine. Uh, that's the smaller of, of the two. Um, and I'll, you'll see a picture in a minute that gives you a, a representation of that. Um, and we're in the process of completing the detailed design and spatial integration of the replacement to the current Vanguard class of submarines, which supports the Trident nuclear weapon system. Um, and that's the successor program. And, and obviously, coming across the border into Scotland made me slightly apprehensive this morning because, as you're probably aware, there's quite a lot of political debate about the successor program. 
I didn't know whether I was going to get eaten by midges, um, thrown out for being an Englishman, and, and with Scotland just losing yesterday, which was devastating for us all in the Northern Hemisphere, um, or whether I'm bringing a, a successor nuclear submarine into Fazlane prematurely. But either which way, I, I think I made it through okay. Um, we've also then, to, to support the successor programme, we are transforming our business. We're, we're developing 22 new special facilities in, on the Barrow Peninsula. We're developing a whole range of uh, new business process capabilities in order to make us fit for purpose, make us able to bring this new nuclear submarine into build and then through into commission. Um, that's a big challenge for us given the transformational step that we're undertaking. The astute class submarine systems and processes were largely designed in the late 90s. And as we go into this next era of submarine design and build, we've had to nearly reinvent every aspect of how we design the submarine. Um, I'll come on to that in just a minute as to why that's the case. And we've obviously, under a massive program of uh, recruitment and skills, um, we're, we, we operate some of the, the, the most complex naval architecture and engineering disciplines, as well as build disciplines around uh, construction methods. And Barrow and Furness is rapidly becoming the centre of, of the world for some high-end apprenticeships, trainee schemes and graduate schemes. And we're very proud of our uh, skill program. We've been recruiting about a thousand people per annum net over the last three years and we've more than doubled the size of the business in terms of uh, capability and heads. We operate the combat systems for the nuclear fleet. Um, that means we, we design, build and we service and repair the combat system that controls all of the smart end of the submarine. That's, that's all of the censoring equipment, the control systems for any weapon systems, as well as the platform management system for the, for the platform itself. Um, and we turn over at £1.1 billion pounds sterling, um, and we have a very strategic relationship with the United States. We, we share the, common, the design around the common missile compartment for the nuclear deterrent, um, and we also have a strategic relationship around propulsion systems for nuclear propulsion. That's where our business is located. Um, so we're predominantly a UK business, as you can see from there, but we are distributed around the UK. We do all of uh, the design and build up in Barrow and Furness at the end of a long cul-de-sac on the South Lakes Peninsulas, for those that are familiar with that area of the world. Um, and we do uh, program management as well as combat systems design and development in the south of the country. Um, but we've also got an office in New London, uh, in North America, in Connecticut, that's where we manage the collaboration activities with the United States. Um, we, we sit alongside the US defense contractor, um, General Dynamics Electric Boat, and it's with GDEB that we do the joint design of the common missile compartments. And we also have a small team supporting the Canadian Navy with the support of their um, Barrow designed and built submarines. Just a quick insight into Barrow's history. Um, a fascinating place to work. I've, I've been in the business for seven years now and hardly a day goes by where I learn something new about the, the heritage and the, and the pedigree that the shipyard has. Um, we started building submarines and in fact we built the first ever submarine that the Navy commissioned. Um, that was Holland, as you can see there in 1901. Um, quite different, I'm glad to say, the new submarines and uh, it's taken the Navy a long time to see how strategic they are to the, to the capability of the Royal Navy. Um, and then in, in the 60s with Dreadnought, Dreadnought was the first nuclear submarine designed and built in Barrow and Furness. And there you can see go, just being launched on a dynamic ship launch, that's where we literally roll the boat into the sea, as you could probably imagine, from, you remember from some films and things. We don't actually launch submarines like that anymore, it's more of a gentle uh, drop on a ship lift. I, I, I don't know why we call it a ship lift, chaps, because we don't lift the boat, we actually lower the boat carefully into the water. So if you want to see a dynamic launch of a submarine, don't come to Barrow because it's actually quite boring to watch it drop. It, it, it takes about 12 hours for the boat to actually end up in the water. But uh, Dreadnought was the first nuclear submarine uh, launched in Barrow in 1961. Um, and then we did a whole bunch of surface ships, so the, the shipyard does have a strong history in in shipbuilding, surface fleets, 
but we've specialised in nuclear submarines really from um, 1961 and onwards. And the thing I'll just mention on this slide, which is one of our difficult periods, is when the Vanguard class finished in the early 90s, there was quite a pause for thought as the British government and the, and the British Navy, the Royal Navy, considered what was going to happen next. And during that period, up until 2000, during the 90s, um, we saw a significant reduction in UK cap sovereign capability around the design and build of nuclear submarines. And that's been one of the big challenges we've had to overcome. We, we lost um, the capability of a workforce. We went from just under 14,000 people down to about 3,000 people in that era. So we lost an entire generation of knowledge around how to design and build submarines. And what we've been trying, recovering from since then through the Astute program, but as we go towards the successor program, is literally how we redevelop that capability as a business. Uh, and that's been one of the biggest challenges that we've, we are now confronting. There's the shipyard. That's actually quite an up-to-date photograph. That was taken just a few weeks ago. Uh, for those that aren't aware, the weather's always like that in Barrow. Um, it was quite a shock coming to Scotland. There was frost on the ground. In Barrow, it was, it was 10 degrees, so quite tropical. Um, now that, so that, that is showing Barrow on a good day. That is literally, you can see the whole peninsula there, there on the south lakes. Um, and I'll just draw your attention to, is there a pointer on this? Um, in, oh, excuse me. Um, this section in the middle here, uh, that's where we're, we're in the process of building a building that will look as big as this one, nearly. Um, which, which will be part of the build strategy for the successor program. That's one of the 22 new facilities we're building. It's over a half a billion pound investments in the Barrow sites. And with our transformational program around systems and processes, we're investing just under a billion pounds in business capability for, to build a new generation of, of shipbuilders in, in the UK. So that's a little bit about the background. I'll just touch on um, wh what led us to an architected approach for the business. And this was sort of the conundrum that we were confronted with um, when I joined the organisation in 2008. Uh, it became pretty apparent to me that we needed to have a more organised approach to how we were developing business processes and business capability. Um, so in 2010 time period, it became abundantly clear that the legacy of the Astute program, which was quite a, a set of business designs that had organically grown up as we were trying to build the business from a low point in the late 80s, late, uh, sorry, late 90s, to be then fit for purpose as a, uh, a modern high-performing shipyard. It became apparent that the legacy was not robust and we needed to put in place some very strong systems of record and processes for us to then think about developing the organisation. In this timeline here, the organisation has more than doubled in size um, and that's not an easy thing to do without acquiring things, you know, this is all organic growth that we've got to pull together. So in the, about 2010 we were developing a new ERP platform right at the point where the successor programme, and that's just a profile of successor at the bottom and it is proportionate to astute, it's twice as big as an astute class submarine. Uh, this is a significant capability displacing about 18,000 tonnes. Um, so it's the biggest nuclear submarine the Navy have ever owned. Um, and we needed to design that in detail whilst maintaining production capability for the astute class. So we had this combination, this big overlap, and we needed to get a bit more organised, have a more architected approach to how we were designing the business to deal with this high level of intensity. Um, so some joined up thinking is required at that point. How do we make sure that we're flying in formation with regards to our people, our processes, our systems, our data, as well as our facilities programme? How do we try and make sure that we've got our arms around all of that and understand the interdependencies and the risks? We need to demonstrate new ways of thinking. The astute production system is coping with regards to the delivery of the astute programme, but it's not coping well enough. We're not delivering high enough levels of performance to our customer or to our shareholder. So we've, we've had to improve the underlying performance of the business and improve the way we design and release the design into production. 
And that's led to a, a real key to transform the way that the operations teams build these submarines. And John will touch on the transformation agenda um, a bit later this morning. And this is one of the issues we've had to consider, is how we promote new ways of working on the end of a peninsula that's quite insular. Um, you know, if, if there ever was a location that, that could stand behind, not invented here, it's the Barrow Peninsula. Um, so we've had to bring experience with us, bring, inject new thinking and do that in an organised fashion. Plus, we've had to explain architecture to the professional architects, which are the naval architects. So, and this is where it's been interesting bringing two languages together, the, the, the business language of architecture with the naval architecture expertise uh, and deep expertise that goes with the complex job of making sure that a nuclear submarine can dive, can surface, can operate successfully and safely for all that sail on. So, and that was a bit, of, initially we were divided by a common language, but I think we've now got to a point where the, the business architecture, the enterprise architecture, sits comfortably alongside the expert skill sets that we design and build around naval architecture. So, to transform the business, it's been imperative that, that this is underpinned by a robust, strategic and enduring um, process and IT digital platform. Um, it takes us about 10 years to design a nuclear submarine and it takes us about another 10 years to build one. So these are long-term programs um, that require strategic thinking when it comes to our underlying business capability. So this, this um, chart is just there to ex explain the high-level view of what we've been building from the middle out over that sort of uh, the journey we've been on for the last seven or eight years. At the heart of it, we've got this concept of systems of record. So we've, we've, we've built our business model on the back of uh, three principal building blocks, an enterprise resource planning system, that happens to be SAP, and we deployed our first SAP system in uh, the, end of ja uh, the end of 2011, January 2012. Uh, a major investment in product lifecycle management systems, so we have one of the largest PLM systems in the UK with a very large concurrent design team um, working collaboratively with North America around the successor program. And we have a large scale business management system which provides the rest of the, uh, the basis of, of IT required to, for a workforce approaching 10,000 people now if we include our subcontractors. But around that, as we've been putting in place those foundations, we've had to think about how we, we get business value progressively through a more agile approach. As we've put in place the big foundational building blocks, the business needs to constantly evolve and improve, but in an architected arrangement. So we have a, a, a layer of abstraction, which is around business process architecture. We have agile analytics, which is looking at, at increasing ways of bringing business performance, business intelligence and insight off the core platforms. And a big evolution now, which is around engagement. We want to extend the digital um, environment to increasingly more people, but in a secure and controlled manner. When you're dealing with <coughs> government information, ITAR information, Polaris sales um, agreement information, there's a significant challenge around security of all of this. So we've had to think about how we extend ubiquitous access to data through an agile mobile platform, but without compromising the integrity of the very thing we're trying to achieve. Um, and now we're driving forward on, uh, with an innovation agenda. Now we've built those big building blocks and we can start to really exploit an architected approach from a point of credible delivery. We're now driving the agenda in these four main sections. <clears throat> so we, we're, we're digitizing the shop floor. Um, that's about giving information to those that need it when they need it accurately and in timely manner. We're looking at digital da dashboards for, for business insights and to move from a rear view mirror uh, recording environment into a here and now and into more predictive analytics. We've got a key drive with the new facilities to digitize the facilities. There's a lot more automation in our business than there has been traditionally. And how do we connect the Internet of Things together with the rest of the planned and, and production system environments? 
And then finally, it's about the digital process experts. This is making sure that people understand how they work in the context of when they're working and that they've got the right access to knowledge and information to help them deliver their process efficiently. And as part of that, we've got to stimulate the thinking behind this. This is quite revolutionary shipbuilding, um, and we've taken a lot of learning from our colleagues in North America, but also benchmarking shipbuilding elsewhere. And we're trying to stimulate a bit about the planning with the end in mind. Let's, let's get inside our little time machines. Let's go forward five years. Let's envisage successor in full-scale build in the shipyard. What does it feel like? What's the day in the life of one of our key operatives, whether you're, a, you're a, um, a welder or whether you're a supervisor or whether you're an engineer supporting production outputs? What's that look like? And we're using um, Imagine those Imagine forums to try and create a common understanding and an engagement about the requirements. Um, and this has helped us really stimulate the thinking, get a bit more support in the board with regards to doing things differently, the art of the possible, but without being so revolutionary that we're taking on board too much risk. So I'll just um, summarise now. Um, this is very helpful. It's telling me I've got four minutes left. This is brilliant. I think we need one of these in Barrow, John. Um, where we are now, so the value of business architecture is understood um, at all levels in the organisation, and I'm not just saying that. I sit on the management committee, um, and I, I'm never now overly surprised when my HR director or my finance director or my engineering director sit with me and actually talk business architecture back towards me rather than me promoting it to them. That's a big change. And that's come about because... Um, it fits comfortably within the wider business dialogue and objectives that we're running. It's seen as an enabler, it's de-risking, and it is delivering value. So we are a full partner for the business, and uh, the business architected approach occupies the right mindset and sits with the right level of, of complementary priorities with our, with our core product programmes and our core delivery programmes. Um, some really good points to behind that. So this is about building confidence and gaining traction. Um, I'll just, just point out two here, but there's, a, there's many other examples that we've been able to generate over the recent years. But the, the whole security posture that we've delivered as part of this architecture has substantially and demonstrably protected our business from t direct targeted attacks uh, and we are, uh, we are managing an environment which is constantly under um, cyber attack with, with bad guys and bad nations trying to extract government secrets. And we can demonstrate that uh, through a controlled and organised approach, we've balanced the security constraints, but with trying to enable the workforce rather than disable the workforce. And with mobility now, we're really driving that agenda through mobility, and we've just started... Um, with piloting a big mobility project on the commissioning end of the nuclear submarine program. And that's some of the more intense end of our business process when we've actually got the boat in the water and we're, we're literally firing up the nuclear reactor. Using mobile technology to enable workforce productivity in that area is quite complex. So some important projects delivering confidence. So we believe that an architected approach to solving business problems, it works, it's working for us. Yes, of course, we have new challenges and we have emerging challenges, but we're holding firm on that whole programme. Um, and it's been an interesting journey, um, and uh, I look forward to the next 10 years and seeing, hopefully, successor uh, sail up the Walney Channel and we hand the first success boat over to the customer in 2026, thereabouts. Right. So I think that's me just about done. I hope you found that informative. <laughs>